Rabbi Lord Sachs, distinguished rabbis, dignitaries, honorable counsel, Los Angeles city officials, and honored guests, good evening. On behalf of Sephardic Temple to Firth Israel and the board of directors, it is my distinct honor to welcome you all to our distinguished lecture series. On February 2nd of 1920, a few immigrant Sephardic Jews from different countries and different parts of the world got together to form Comunidad Sephardi in hopes of keeping their traditions and customs alive. Since then, Sephardic Temple has remained a welcoming home and a safe haven for Sephardic Jews from many countries, including Morocco, Egypt, Turkey, Rhodes, Cuba, Mexico, South Africa, Iraq, and Iran, to name a few. Join us on any given Shabbat, and you will hear the same beautiful Ladino melodies that were used back then. We are turning 100 years old now and are looking forward to stepping into our next 100 years with enthusiasm, strength, and commitment. I feel blessed and honored to serve as the president of this remarkable congregation during this significant time in our history. Education and learning are major cornerstones for us at Sephardic Temple. That is why, through the efforts of Rabbi Sessler and the hard work of our directors and staff, the Distinguished Speaker Series was started. We are honored that you, Rabbi Lord Sachs, one of the great Jewish minds of our time, a light unto many nations, as noted by Prince of Wales, has accepted our invitation to join us tonight. The best way to introduce a philosopher and a rabbi and a thinker is by another philosopher, rabbi, and a thinker. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Rabbi Tal Sester of Sephardic Temple. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. We start this majestic and unique evening with a recitation of Psalm 131. Shira ma'alot le David. Adonai lo gavali bi velo ramu enai. Velo hilachti bigdulot uveniflaot mimeni. Im lo shiviti vedomamti nafshi. Kagamol alei imo, kagamol alei nafshi. Yachel Israel el Adonai, me'ata ve'ad olam. A psalm for the ascent by King David. Almighty God, let our hearts not be elevated, nor our eyes heightened. Let us walk not in ways more formidable and wondrous than ours, lest we first practice soulful equanimity and spiritual quietude. May the Jewish people long for God Almighty from now to eternity. Amen. Birshut Shamaim with permission from on high. Birshut Harav, with permission of our monumental rabbi. Birshut Harabanim, with the permission of all rabbis present here. Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for attending. 
Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we are in the presence of greatness. The leading Jewish mind of our time and one of the foremost public intellectuals in the world entire, reflecting not only about the Jewish condition but the human condition writ large. A person who was introduced at Yale University as one of the prime spiritual figures of our time, together with the Dalai Lama and the Pope. Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs' encyclopedic knowledge in Torah, in Jewish spirituality, and in secular and worldly wisdom is unrivaled and incomparable. His contribution to Jewish and human thought in our days, in our time, in our historical epoch can be summarized, I believe, in two words in the English language, indispensable and incalculable. To truly understand and internalize the rabbi's contribution to Jewish thought and to human thought today, one needs to revert to a concept and a phrase articulated by Rabbi Lord Sachs himself, namely, that the meaning of the system lies outside the system. Rabbi Sachs's grandeur of spirit supersedes his overt, formal, academic, external achievements on the revealed level, what the Kabbalah calls Alma Deit Galya his innumerable degrees and books and honorary prizes. Rabbi Sachs, to quote a contemporary British academic, is transforming the epistemology of theology in our time, which means in simpler English that Rabbi Sachs is revolutionizing the way we think religion. And he's also an excelling disciple of his rabbi, the late Lubavitcher Rebbe, who gave him his life's vocation to kindle Jewish souls on fire. In the words of Rashi, Ad shalhevet me'eleha, until the soul of each and every Jew, the world entire, is inflamed with godliness for perpetuity. With his majestic weekly Torah commentaries, Rabbi Lord Professor Jonathan Sachs spiritually nourishes the inner fountains of countless Jews and non-Jews alike. People speak today with great philosophical and theological longings about the late Rav Soloveitchik Zatzal and Abraham Joshua Heschel. Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs undoubtedly is the contemporary equivalent of those masters and giants. And so befittingly beloved friends, I'm going to ask you all to kindly rise and recite a bracha that I would venture to postulate most of us never recited before. We will recite it first in Hebrew, and then we will explain it in English. Please reiterate with me. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Shechalak Michochmato Lireav. Which means the following. Blessed are you, Hashem, King of the universe, who imparted a measure of his infinite wisdom upon those who verily revere him upon a mere mortal flesh and blood. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving an otherworldly welcome to an exemplary human being and to the spiritual and existential mentor of an entire generation of Jews and non-Jews alike, Kvod Harav Yaakov Tzvi, the Honorable Rabbi Lord Jonathan Henry Sachs Shlita.
Wow. <laughs> what a welcome. And it makes me feel two things. Number one, very humbled. And number two, maybe I ought to stay in LA. <laughs> but what a joy it is to be here. I must tell you, um, coming from uh, Britain, you, you may have noticed, I don't know whether the news reached you here in LA, that uh, our royal family has been having a little mishpachology, you know, a little. <laughs> so it's a joy to be able to leave behind the problems of one royal family and join the celebrations of another royal family, namely the members of Tiferes Israel. You really are a royal family. If we say, Avinu Malkenu, our father, is the king, that makes every one of us, every single one of us, princes and princesses. And you have done one thing which has proved challenging to other royal families, namely, you have been able to keep the family together. <laughs> because uh, your community, as your president has mentioned, comes from so many different places of origin with so many different Jewish histories from Israel, from Turkey, from Rhodes, Greece, Egypt, Iraq, Iran, Cuba, and even the USA. And you have taken them and made of all of you one family. And that is very, very beautiful. You have maintained with great faithfulness and pride your Sephardi traditions and customs. And I have to confess I am not a Sephardi. I hope this doesn't shock you. <laughs> but I admire the Sephardi loyalty to tradition so much because you have a unique blend. And this is the great distinction of the Sephardim, of clear mind, warm heart, and unshakable soul. And to find all of those together is really, really special. So I have, over the last few years, been accustomed to say, Yasha Chayli, if I had the power to do so, I would convert all Ashkenazim to become Sephardi. <laughs> <clears throat> but the fact is that you have a combination of a truly outstanding community, a beautiful shul, and a really, really special rabbi, Rabbi Tal Sessler. An extraordinary combination of, of real neshama, of real soul, and great intellect. I have to tell you, having conversed with him over the course of today, I have to tell you, he knows my books much better than I do. <laughs> but then, when it comes to my books, I only write them, I never read them. So. <laughs> but I uh, bless him, Kvodarav, and the Rabbanit, Dr. Nina, and your young uh, Eliana and Noah, May they grow to be a pride to Am Yisrael, and we thank you, Rabbi Sessler, for all you've done for the community. I want to thank also, of course, your Chazan, Chaim Mizrahi. <laughs> who has served this community so well and so beautifully for all these years. You, as a community, have a proud past, a great future, and as you celebrate this momentous centenary we thank Hashem, Shechianu, Vikiyamanu, Vihigianu, Lazman Hazeh. Amen. Friends, you've asked me to speak about the um, challenges facing the Jewish people in the 21st century. And it's very interesting how we perceive challenges. There is one nation almost as old as we are, the Chinese, who uh, have this, uh, China has been around for a long time. I had the privilege when I was chief rabbi in Britain of also visiting every year the Jewish community in Hong Kong, uh, Ohel Leah. And so I was there when Chris Patton, the British uh, Governor General, uh, retired. Britain had to give back Hong Kong to the Chinese. Uh, I don't think I would have done so, but you know, Brits are Brits. And uh, 
So I had the privilege always, I used to meet with the acting head of state wherever I went for the first time. I had the privilege of meeting the first Beijing appointed governor of Hong Kong, Mr. Tung Shi Wa. He was a lovely man, very, very philo Semitic, very pro Israel. And uh, he said to me, you know, he said to me, we, you Jews and we Chinese have been around a long time. He said, we've been around 5,000 years, and by my reading, you've been around 6,000 years. He said, what I wanted to know was, what did you do for the first 1,000 years <laughs> before you had kosher Chinese takeaways? I said, you, you want to know what the Jewish people did for those thousand years before they had kosher Chinese takeaways? They complained about the food. <laughs> but if I ask what allowed China to survive for so long, its civilization for so long, it is the famous fact that the Chinese ideogram for crisis also means opportunity. If you see any crisis as also an opportunity, you have resilience. There is only one language I know that goes one better, and that is Hebrew. Because the Hebrew word for crisis is mashber. But mashber also means a birthing stool. So every crisis in Hebrew is chevlei leda. Something new is being born. So we don't only see crisis as opportunity, we see crisis as a spur to creativity, to something new. And so it was in every crisis in Jewish history. The destruction of the first temple in the Babylonian exile led to the renewal of whom Ezra and Nehemiah are the great exemplars of Torah in the life of Jews. The destruction of the second temple by the Romans led to the writing down of the incredible literature of Torah Shebal Peh, the oral law, Midrash, Mishnah, Gemara. The, uh, uh, the encounter with Christianity in the Middle Ages led to the birth of, of Jewish biblical commentary in reply to the way the Christians were reading the Bible. The encounter with Islam led to the birth of Jewish philosophy. That is who the Rambam was in dialogue with. Uh, the uh, Crusades led to the Hasid Ashkenaz. The Spanish expulsion led to the mystics in Safat who wrote those beautiful poems that we ring, you did Nefesh, Lachad Dodi. The greatest tragedy of all to hit our people in 2,000 years, the Holocaust, led directly to the founding of Medina Yisrael, the greatest affirmation of life in 2,000 years of Jewish history. We don't just survive crises. We grow and become stronger through them. And that is how it should be with all the three crises that I'm going to speak about this evening. Number one, anti-Semitism. Number two, Jewish identity and our loss of many young Jews. And number three, the fraught relationship, not here, but elsewhere in American Jewry between some American Jews and the state of Israel. And I want to talk about those three today. And every one of them seems to me to be an opportunity, not just a crisis. Number one, anti-Semitism. This could not sadly be more timely. Uh, world leaders are just gathering. Monsieur Macron arrived in Jerusalem today. Leaders from 47 different countries are gathering in Yushalayim to observe the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. They will all be there in uh, Yad Vashem. Uh, among them, your Vice President, Mike Pence, and our Prince Charles, who will deliver a very, very strong personal speech about how the Holocaust and, and Holocaust survivors have, have had an impact on his life. But you have had now a, a horrendous rise of anti-Semitism in this place that we expected at least. Here in Los Angeles, am I right, you've had swastika daubings, uh, including a, a shul and a school. Um, you've had the terrible tragedies elsewhere of Pittsburgh and Poe and Jersey City and Monsey. In Britain, uh, we had a leader of the Labour Party, uh, one of our two big parties, who made that party a safe haven for anti-Semites and anti-Zionists. Of course, he, I have to say, in deference to the leader of the Labour Party, he performed a miracle. He united Jews. 
I have never seen our community so united. It was amazing. All the docs reformed secular. They all turned up. They all spoke up overnight. You know, it was, uh, it was a complete new face of Anglo Jewry. It brought out our Jewishness in a way nothing else had done. Until then, you know, in Anglo Jewry, we'd been very uh, profil namuch. We didn't want to, as the English say, uh, upset the horses. You know, you keep a very, very low profile. Suddenly, we stu- uh, as, as, as a philosopher, you have a philosopher rabbi here. You need a PhD for this joke, but a philosopher once said that the Anglo-Jewish identity was incognito ergo sum. <laughs> you know, you just, you just don't tell anyone you're Jewish, basically. So uh, the return of anti-Semitism to the world has happened within living memory of the Holocaust. After more than half a century of Holocaust education, more than half a century of interfaith dialogue, more than half a century of anti-racist legislation, this is shocking. It is deeply shocking. It is a stain on humanity. Why has it happened? Obviously, anti-Semitism is a, a very complex phenomenon, and I don't want to simplify it. But if I must, The answer is that the world is changing faster than people can bear. And the digital revolution is creating turbulence, the like of which the world hasn't seen since the invention of printing in the 15th century. And everything is suddenly changed. Now, when the world is changing, there are two possible roads you can go down. One road says, what shall we do? That is the good road. But the bad road says, who did this to us? And that is the road some people take. And when that happens, three things happen. Number one, when you say, who did this to us? You define yourself as a victim. And that's a bad place to be. Number two, you then are forced to search for a scapegoat whom you identify as the perpetrator, the victimizer. And number three, over history, the scapegoat of choice has been the Jews. Why? Because for 1,000 years, they were the most prominent non-Christian minority in a Christian Europe, And today, the state of Israel is the most obvious and prominent non-Muslim presence in a Muslim Middle East. We are the people who get singled out. Now, there is no logic to anti-Semitism. You can't deal with it logically. It's a bundle of contradictions. Jews have been hated because they were rich and because they were poor, because they were capitalists, because they were communists because they kept to themselves and because they infiltrated everywhere. Voltaire hated Jews because he held that they believed in an ancient superstitious faith. Stalin hated Jews because they were rootless cosmopolitans who believed in nothing. So how do you explain a phenomenon that is fraught all the way through with contradiction? The only way I could do it, and I did this some 20 years ago, is to compare it to a virus. It's a virus. That's what it is. It affects people without, sometimes without understanding what is happening to them. And the human body has the most incredible um, defense against viruses called the immune system. Now, how do viruses survive the immune system? The answer is they mutate so that the immune system doesn't recognize them. And that is what has happened to anti-Semitism. Every time a very effective defense against it has been created, an immune system, as was created after the Holocaust, the virus mutates. So we are living through the third mutation. In the Middle Ages, Jews were hated for their religion. In the 19th and 20th centuries, they were hated for their race. Today, they are hated for their nation state. Anti-Zionism is one form of the new anti-Semitism. Now, I have said this many, many times. 
And I get challenged on this. I got challenged on, on B- BBC television news on this. Rabbi Sachs, aren't you saying that all criticism of Israel is anti-Semitism? I said to the interviewer, actually a week ago, I was in a school with 16-year-old kids, and they asked me the same question. So I said to the kids in the school, hands up all those who believe it is legitimate to criticize Britain. Everyone put their hands up. I said, how many of you believe Britain has no right to exist? Nobody put their hands up. So I said to the television interviewer, if 16-year-old school children can understand the difference, so can you. So anti-Semitism has returned. I realized this in 2001. I grew up with non-Jewish friends, went to a non-Jewish university, spent my life among non-Jews, and I never once experienced anti-Semitism, not a single time. In 2001, our youngest daughter, who was then studying at the London School of Economics, went to an anti-globalization rally, which turned quickly into a tirade against America, then to a diatribe against Israel, and finally to an assault on Jews. She came back that night with tears in her eyes and said, Dad, they hate us. Now, our children, she is one of the strongest people I know. And to see her, 21 years old, with tears in her eyes, I thought this I did not expect to see in the 21st century. Now, it is important for us to realize that this is not Germany or Europe in the 1930s. It really isn't. We have to make a clear distinction. In July 1938, representatives of 32 countries gathered in the French spa town of Evian, knowing that something horrendous was going to happen to the Jews. Hitler had already used the word vernichtung, uh, extermination. And so they knew what was happening. Those 32 nations, every single one of them, decided not to open its doors to Jews. And at that point in history, Jews knew there was not one square foot on earth that they could call home in the sense given by the poet Robert Frost when he said, home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to let you in. Jews had no home. Today, Baruch Hashem, we have a home. We have the state of Israel, which is a home to every single one of us. And incidentally, that is why we must, must, must support the state of Israel against all its enemies. But this means, this means that um, <clears throat> we have to face anti-Semitism without fear, without fear. And what do we have to do? Three things. Number one, this occurred to me in 2003 when we organized as a conference of European rabbis for Romano Prodi, the then head of the European Union, to convene a conference on anti-Semitism in the EU headquarters in Brussels. There were a thousand people in the chamber. And as I looked around, to my horror, I saw that around 950 of them were Jews. And I thought, this is not going to cure anti-Semitism. And I got up, and these are the words with which I began my speech. Jews cannot fight anti-Semitism alone. The victim cannot cure the crime. The hated cannot cure the hate. I fight for the right of Christians everywhere in the world to live their faith without fear. But I need you Christians to fight for the right of Jews to live without fear. Mm. I said, I lead the fight in Britain against Islamophobia, but I need you Muslims 
to lead the fight against Judeophobia. And so we decided then and there that in Britain at least, the fight against anti-Semitism would be led by non-Jews. And, and it has been. It has been led by all the prime ministers since then, by Tony Blair, by Gordon Brown, David Cameron, by Theresa May, and indeed by Boris Johnson. Uh, they have all been solidly, they have led the fight. It's been led by non-Jewish members of parliament, some of whom resigned their membership of the Labour Party because of this. It has been led by leaders of other faiths, including the Archbishop of Canterbury and leaders of the Sikh and Hindu communities and by moderate Muslims. It has been led by uh, John le Carre, J.K. Rowling, and other iconic figures like that in the world of arts and literature. And I want to tell you something. You may not have read about this, but as our community was, was really fraught by this recent election and thinking that there's a possibility that a, 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 an anti-Semite or at least a close friend of anti-Semites might win the election. And our community was, I've never seen it so anxious. And at the height of that anxiety, just before the election, Prince Charles held a reception for 400 members of the Jewish community in Buckingham Palace and stood up and said, no community has contributed more to Britain than the Jewish community. <laughs> Here, your president has taken a clear and strong stand against anti-Semitism. And I, be, I believe his recent executive order will assist the fight against BDS and the intimidation of Jewish students on campus. It is very, very important that non-Jews lead. It's important that we remember we have enemies, yes, but we also have friends, good and special friends, and we should take the time to make more because they could not be more important to us. So that's number one. Number two is security. I can see you really had it here tonight. This is most impressive. Thank you for that. Um, security is important because people who seek to harm Jews always search out soft targets. And we have to make sure that no Jewish uh, shul, school, premises, none of them is a soft target. You will need a lot of... Uh, major activity on the part of the community and financial help from the government to have things like security doors, blast-proof windows, security guards, and so on. Our Jewish community has been doing this for a very, very long time. And it has helped us so far, Baruch Hashem, avoid any really major uh, attack on, physical attack on Jews. And we have something called the Community Security Trust, which has about 60 professionals, experts, monitoring all potential threats to the community. It works hand in hand with the government and the police force. Uh, and then we have 4,000 volunteers standing as voluntary security uh, on all our premises. I have to tell you, it is wonderful. And it does some unusual and unexpected things. I hope I don't shock you if I tell you that not every single young Jew wants to spend their time inside a synagogue. <laughs> I... So what did CSD do? It took standing outside a synagogue and turned it into a mitzvah. Now, when you're standing security for a long time and there's nothing much happening and you've got a young man and a young woman standing security duty, they get talking to one another and our security volunteers turned out to be the best shiduch agency we've ever had. <laughs> so do the security and that, that's important. And finally, never let, let anti-Semitism make us afraid. I once told the story of a very, very orthodox Haredi rabbi who in the end of the 1980s went to Moscow as Glasnost and Perestroika was happening. It was opening up uh, life to Jews. The only trouble was this easing of, 
of, of communist rule open, opened the door not only for Jews but also for anti-Semites. And a young Jewish woman came to see this rabbi in a state of shock and, and concern. And um, she said, you know, all my life, nobody ever commented on my Jewishness. And now when I walk in the street, they shout at me, Jid, Jid. And the rabbi turned to the young lady and said, well, look at the way I'm dressed. He was wearing a kapota and a shrimal. He said, they probably don't take me for an Episcopalian. He said, and yet no one has shouted jeed at me. Why do you think that is? And she said, you know why? Because they know I will take it as an insult, but you will take it as a compliment. Now, there is a very deep lesson there. Wear your identity with pride. That's probably the best thing we can do to let anti-Semites know they cannot win. So just remember, just remember, every civilization that ever sought to destroy Jews, whether it was Egypt or Assyria or Babylon or Greece or Rome or the medieval empires of Christianity or Islam, all the way to the Third Reich and the Soviet Union, every one of those superpowers that bestrode the narrow world as a colossus has been consigned to history, and we, this tiny vulnerable people, can still stand and sing, Am Yisrael Chai, we win the battle. Now look, number two, that is anti-Semitism. Number two, disaffiliation. We know, and the Svarim here are exceptional in not facing this challenge quite as much as the Ashkenazim are, but there is a major challenge to Jewish identity here in the diaspora. Today in America, when young Jews are asked, what religion are you, 30% say none. Throughout the Jewish world, between two in three and three in four of young Jews is deciding not to marry another Jew, have Jewish children, and continue the Jewish story. It's a real, real tragedy. The late Shlomo Kalbach used to, he spent his life going around campuses, and he once said, I ask, because he always included non-Jews in his concert as well, and he always used to say, when I ask people, what are you? And somebody said, a Catholic? I said, I knew that's a Catholic. Protestant, I knew that's a Protestant. I'm just a human being, I know that's a Jew. <laughs> and it really is a tragedy. And how do we approach this? Number one, just to remember the story of our people. My late great grandfather, Alava Shalom, was a historian who, among other things, uh, traced the family history. So we have a family tree which goes back to the Maharal of Prague, which goes back to Rashi, which goes back to Yehuda Hanasi, which goes back to David HaMelech, which goes back to Yehuda, which goes back to Yaakov and Yitzchak, etc., etc. And I showed this family tree to our children once when they were young, and one of my daughters turned to me and said, Hey, Dad, Dad, we're, we're descended from Abraham and Sarah. We're famous. And I had to tell her every single Jew has a family tree like that. We're all royalty. Do we really want a story that's lasted for 4,000 years to end with us? How can we do such a thing? That's number one, just to be given a sense of, 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 uh, of where we come from, the gift of an identity and a history, the like of which no other people has had. But number two, looking to the future. You know, there was a lady from San Francisco who got in touch with me and said, Rabbi Sachs, you know, you've been talking about the social media and smartphones, and we're here in Silicon Valley, and I must tell you, our kids spend all their time on their smartphones and their Facebook, Instagram, and it's terrible. It's terrible for their social skills. It's terrible for their eye contact. It's terrible... Even when we're having meals, they're holding their phone under the table and texting their friends. She said, so we decided as a family, we talked it through and we decided we are going to have as a family 
one day a week, a screen-free day. No phones, no tablets, no laptops. She said, you love what we're calling it. We're going to call it Shabbos. <laughs> I can't tell you how important Shabbat is. And sometimes I think non-Jews appreciate this even better than we do. You know, I spent a week, Elena and I, my wife and I spent a week in in Amritsar, which is the Jerusalem of the Sikhs, where the Golden Temple is. We spent it with the Sikhs, with the Hindus, with the Dalai Lama. We spent a week. And uh, I'm standing, Dalai Lama and I and spoke to the 2,000 students at the Sikh University, and I couldn't believe it that one of the leaders of the Sikh community worldwide, um, um, uh, Babaji, what's, I've forgotten his full name, Mahinder Singh, got up in front of 2,000 Sikh students in Ramritsa and said, we Sikhs need what the Jews have. They call it Shabbos. <laughs> he said, can you imagine one day in seven when you don't do any work and you just spend time with the family, with friends? We need Shabbos. I said to him, Babaji, could you come and give that sermon in one of our shoes? <laughs> 2010, there was a conference on climate change in Copenhagen, United Nations. And the Secretary of State for the Environment asked uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury and myself to bring together religious leaders before that conference to show, tell him what our religious traditions are on caring for God's earth. And so I said, well, look, you know, I have one simple solution to solve climate change. Keep Shabbos. Because no cars, no planes, no anything. You cut down the carbon footprint by a seventh, it'll cure global warming. An imam came up to me and said, you know, I never looked at it that way. I'm going to tell my congregation not to drive to the mosque on Friday. I said, imam, come and tell that sermon in one of our shoes, please. <laughs> two years ago, the Archbishop of York, the number two in the hierarchy of the Anglican Communion worldwide, spent Shabbos with us in Marble Arch Synagogue 25 hours from Kabbalat Shabbat to Havdalah. He dovened with us, he sang with us, he ate with us, he learned with us. His name is John Santamu. I said, John, why are you doing this? He said, because one of the greatest gifts of you Jews to us Christians is the Sabbath. And we are losing it and you are keeping it. So I want to come and see how you are keeping it. It is a wonderful, wonderful gift that, um, that, 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 that is the antidote to the pressures of a 24-7 world, the horrific effects of too much exposure to the social media, and so on have. Shabbat was made for the 21st century. Number three, I don't know if any religion ever has valued the individual more. You know, nefesh achat ka'olam malay. One life is like a universe. And because we value the individuals, Jews are a nation of outstanding individuals. We never merge in a crowd. We say, the Lord is my shepherd. But no Jew was ever a sheep. You know, we all do our thing differently. And because of that, I don't know, we just produce greatness every Direction you look, here on the West Coast, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg are Jewish, Sergey Brin of Google is Jewish, Sam Mendes, have you seen his film? Because it's going to win all the Oscars, I think. 1917 is Jewish. Daniel Radcliffe, who was Harry Potter, is Jewish. The one that my grandchildren tell me is the heartthrob of the moment, Timothy uh, Chalamet is Jewish. Your most successful record, pop record producer, Mark Ronson, is Jewish. I'm sure the almighty created Gentiles, but somehow or other, you don't hear about them that often, you know. So, now, how is it that this tiny, tiny people produces these extreme talents? They're not all of them very Jewish, but somehow or other, he planted in us the idea that every one of us counts. And in an age of, of, of mass viral videos and, and crowds, we stand out for the value of the individual. And that too is a great gift to our children and grandchildren. And you know, one of the things that all this, the, these new technologies are actually reconfiguring the brain and making it very hard to concentrate for a long time. 
I do a program for the BBC and their news program called Thought for the Day, which used to be three minutes long and 15 years ago was cut down to two minutes, 45 seconds on the grounds that nobody can concentrate for three minutes anymore. I think it must be down to 15 seconds now. Twitter is certainly down to, to that. And you think of the Daf Yomi, the Siyo Mashas that's just taken place, you know, where you are studying one text for seven and a half years, there's nothing like it in world civilization. The cure for AHDH, this is the Jewish commitment to studying and learning and letting us be lifted by the text. So I really think that, uh, and I also think that Judaism today is so important in a world of change because Living Judaism does extraordinary things for us. It strengthens family. It strengthens community. It gives us an identity. It gives us a sense of global connectedness. It gives us a commitment to help, helping others. It develops the mind, the heart, and the soul. And in an age of climate change, of global instability, of the uncertain impact of AI, of fragmented societies, deep divisions, no people, no faith has handled uncertainty longer and more successfully than we have. So I think Judaism is the gift for the future, not just of the past. And, uh, you know, I was so struck, I think I write it in one of my books. Your rabbi really knows my books better than I do, so I'll ask you where it appears. But there was a great English literary scholar, he was famous throughout Britain, called A.L. Rouse, fellow of All Souls College, Oxford. And the last book he wrote, just before he died, was called Historians I Have Known. And the penultimate sentence of that book is, if there is any honor in all the world that I should like, it would be to be an honorary Jewish citizen. Now, he never lived long enough for me to find out why he wrote that sentence. But that was the last but one sentence he wrote in his life. And I find that very moving. So we have to communicate this to our kids because they are leaving, if they leave our faith, they will not find something better outside. And we have to do it as compellingly as we can, which is why, as you probably, some of you will know, we've tried to use the new media to speak to young people through YouTube, through Facebook, through Instagram, through Spotify. I haven't got a clue what those things are. <laughs> but it seems to touch young people, and that is how we have to do it. We have to take that eternal message and make it live again through the new media. That is Jewish identity, and finally Israel. I don't know how this difference of opinion, there's a conference taking place now or soon in Beit HaNasi, hosted by President Reuven Rivlin, with leaders of the American Jewish community to try and heal the rifts between American Jewry and Israel. Now, how those rifts happen, I really don't know, except that I do. The answer is politics. But since when was our connection to Israel political? Israel is our home. It is the place to which we have been traveling since the days of Avram Avinu and Moshe Rabbeinu. Its language is ours, its landscape is ours, its calendar is ours. You can stand in Jerusalem and know that here in Yushalayim, over there is where Avram and Yitzchak walked when they traveled towards the binding. It was here that David HaMelech made its capital. It's here that Shlomo HaMelech made the temple. Here that Jeremiah prophesied. Here that Ezra and Nehemiah gathered the exiles. Here that Rabbi Akiva looked down from Harad Sofim on the ruins. It is here that Yehuda HaLevi traveled. It is here that Ramban rebuilt the old Yishuv. And if we in the diaspora don't like Israeli politics, most Israelis don't like Israeli politics. You know, from this you don't die, you know. So if you don't like some rabbinical decisions in Israel, not every Israeli does. But the truth is, I'm sure that some Americans don't like some American politicians. <laughs> but does that mean you don't like America? You love America. To me, Israel is the miracle of miracles. No people.
No people has ever survived a 2,000-year exile and returned and rebuilt its land. No people has ever taken a language that for 2,000 years had not been the language of everyday speech and made it speak again. No people has ever survived a tragedy like the Holocaust and defiantly said, Lo amut ki I will not die, but I will live and I will testify to the living God. No people has ever been scattered across the globe and then been ingathered and reunited exactly as Moshe Rabbeinu foresaw. If you are scattered the very ends of earth and heaven, from there, says God, I will bring, gather you and bring you back. Israel is a miracle of biblical proportions. And even if it doesn't make you believe in God, at least let it make you believe in the people of God. If Moses Hess, if Moses Montefiore, if Theodore Herzl could see Israel today, they would not believe it. It is an amazing, amazing country. Sorry. Here is one of the oldest peoples in the world, and it is at the cutting edge of some of the newest technology in the world. Medical technology, information technology, nanotechnology. And sometimes the old and the new come together in unexpected ways. Two years ago, a group of Haredi Dayanim came, asked, could they come and see me? I mean, it, it's, oh, fine, I didn't know what they wanted from me. Uh, so they come and see me with their kapotas and their gatlach. And I'm thinking, what are they going to talk about? And you wouldn't believe this. They told me they are writing the ethics code for autonomous self-driving vehicles. <laughs> now, can you imagine this? You know, I mean... You know the problems that the ethic codes of autonomous vehicles are. You know, you see, you're on a, it suddenly starts raining and the car starts skidding and there are two cyclists in front of you and one is wearing a crash helmet and one is not wearing a crash helmet. Who do you crash into? If you crash into the one with the crash helmet on the grounds that he may survive, then you're, then you're penalizing him. I mean, if you crash into the one without a helmet, you're endangering his life. But if you crash into the one wearing a helmet, you're penalizing him for keeping the law. So what do you do in a situation like this? Well, I tell you, not even Stanford tells you how to answer that question, but you spend your lifetime learning Gomorrah, then me on the one hand, on the other. It's easy. So somehow or other, Israel brings together the oldest of the old and the newest of the new. This is a completely true story, and uh, it is a place where miracles happen daily. But what is really remarkable about Israel and really important about Israel is the way it represents in a part of the world obsessed with killing and with death the biblical command, Uvacharta Vachaim, choose life. Jews, when they came to Israel, systematically chose life in ways that are almost unbelievable. They came to a land that was desolate, that had been neglected for centuries. So they became the most innovative farmers in the world. They're surrounded by enemies. They become the greatest soldiers in the world. They have to cope with suicide bombers. They be develop the most effective anti-terrorist measures that anyone has ever taken. They are faced with missiles. They invent Iron Dome. They have faced with tunnels. They have just developed ultra-sensitive listening devices that they are, as we speak, installing on the Lebanese border. Every single thing they do is Uvocharta Vachayim. And do you know what, what is really impressive about Israel? There is a statement that we read in Shul this Shabbat about Pharaoh afflicting the people. And listen to what the Torah says. Kashe ya'anu oto kenir be v'chenir fruits. The more they were afflicted, the stronger they became. And that is what Israel proves to the world. The more afflicted Israel is, the stronger it becomes. And it is a role model to all humanity of what it is to choose life. The truth is that if a Jew today cannot stand proud of Israel, what can you stand proud of?
zu Atzenu, zu Amenu. This is our land, this is our people, and the greatest privilege of our time is that we have seen it. The greatest prophets saw it in a vision, we have seen it with our own eyes. And I have to say that this is the privilege of being alive at this time. So to summarize, number one, we can defeat anti-Semitism if we have friends, if we have security, and if we have self-confidence. Number two, we can inspire our children to be Jewish and to respect Judaism if we realize that it represents not just a great past, but also an extraordinarily powerful future. Number three, we have to stay, stop playing politics with Israel. Israel represents our people at their very best and it deserves our support, our, our love, and our, and our devotion. So, because Israel really is where Judaism comes alive, because it represents a victory of life over death, of security over terror, of freedom over repression, democracy over tyranny, tyranny and hope over despair. So, I end with a story which is a very old story, so your rabbi knows it by heart and probably already told it to you, but I don't mind, okay? You'll hear it from me with two witnesses as proof that it's true. But this happened 40, 45 years ago, that Elaine and I, you may have noticed that the British weather is not exactly the same as Los Angeles weather. It's cold, it's damp, it's miserable, and we love it. But comes winter, when it's really cold, damp, and miserable, it can get very depressing. And so for the first time in our lives, I said to Elaine, let's get, go and get some winter sun. We'll go to Elat. Now, Elat was very undeveloped in those days. People in my shul said, Rabbi, don't go to Elat. Their standards of dress are, are not necessarily rabbonish. <laughs> but we went anyway, and you know what? They were right. So I spent a week without my glasses on. <laughs> bumping into trees and lampposts and things. And, and I, I said to Elaine, you know, I said to Elaine, what can we do that's vaguely rabbonish, you know? And finally we came across these glass bottom boats that you go on and you see all the lovely fish. I don't know if they're there anymore. This was a very long time ago, way before Ella was built up as it is now. And we went on the boat, and we were the only people on the boat. And we were talking to each other, and the captain heard us speaking English and came up very excitedly and said, Atame Anglia. And we said, yeah, why do you ask? He said, well, I was just on a holiday in England. And so I said, did you like it? He said, ah, oh, wonderful. The buildings, so old. The grass, so green. The people, so polite. And then he looked around him and they light was then, you know, just barren brown desert and hills. And he looked at this barren landscape and opened his arms wide. And he said, Avalzer Shelano. But this is ours. Friends, there are other nations, other faiths, and other countries, but this is ours. It's Hashem's great gift to us. Let us keep it, be proud of it, and hand it on to the next generation. Amen. Rabbi, thank you for giving us a fortifying dosage of Ahavat Yisrael, which reminds me, if I may share with everybody here, when I was in my teens, I was one of those teenagers who were sent to witness the camps 
where a third of our people perished, is telling the community a couple of Shabbat ago, Rabbi, how one can walk into Maidanek and still see the remnants of the cyclone B, the, the blue color on the wall. There's children's shoes within grasp, within reach, and a pile of human ash, hundreds of thousands of our people. And I was at the synagogue where my late grandfather was spending one year of his life in Krakow, and there was a survivor there, and I told him, I'm looking for this street, Ditla, Ditlovska, maybe number 17, where my grandfather was from 38 to 39. He was deported with Hesho on uh, October 26, 1938. That saved his life, and Heschel's life as well. And this survivor grabbed me by my palm. I'll never forget this. As long as I live... And he said to me in Hebrew, The most important thing in the world is the Baal Atanya, the first Chabad Rebbe, whose Anyo, as we say here, whose Yorzeit was earlier today, Ahavat Israel, the unconditional love of every Jew. And Rabbi, you infused us with this love tremendously. Thank you. <laughs> Rabbi, as, as you well know, sir, there are two approaches to texts. One is the late Jacques Derrida's approach, a great Sephardic Jew and philosopher passed away in 2004 who postulated, il n'y a rien hors du texte. There is nothing but the text. When you read a book, the book stands solitary and supreme. And then there are those who say, really, that to understand a book, you must know the soul which authored this book. And so we'd like to begin, Rabbi, with sharing with everyone here your familial and, social and soulful origins. You're one of four boys. We won't tell the audience how old are you, but you were born two months and six days before the state of Israel came into being. <laughs> your father came to Britain as a Polish refugee at the age of six and had to leave school at the tender age of 14. Your mother, Rabbi, had to leave school at the age of 16. And as you said in interviews, they may have not had the opportunities to acquire much knowledge, but they more than made for it in their abundance of love of Judaism and God and Avat Israel. And then usually your next move, Rabbi, is to quote so magnificently the English romantic poet Wordsworth, who teaches us that which we love Judaism, Torah, God, Israel, others will love too, our children and grandchildren, and we will teach them how by emulating Rabbi Sachs. We will teach them how. And then, Rabbi, uh, you went on to read uh, philosophy in Cambridge in the second half of the 60s. You submerged yourself in all the great thinkers of the West, from the pre Socratic thinkers to Bertrand Russell of the time. And then came the waiting period before the Six-Day War, and all the Jews suddenly identified themselves as Jews, the scholars and the students. And then you, find, you found yourself, distinguished rabbi, to quote the name of a well-known article by Chadam Al-Parashat Rachim on an existential juncture, and you undertook a pilgrimage to the two towering rabbinic figures of the time, Rav Soloveitchik Zatzal, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Zchuto Yagen Aleinu. At some point, you get to these promised shores of Beverly Hills, and you're given an audience with the, with the rabbi. Would you care to share with everyone, uh, Rabbi, what brought you to New York, and how your encounter with the rabbi transformed your life from a prospective career in economics or law or professorship into a spiritual vocation? I think the Six-Day War had a transforming effect on all my generation because we only, the people who only know it in retrospect know it as an amazing and unparalleled victory for Israel. But the weeks leading up to it were horrendous. Really, we who had been born after the Holocaust felt that a second Holocaust, God forbid, was shaping to take place. Nasser had spoken about driving all the Jews into the sea. 
and uh, Syrian, uh, Egyptian and Syrian armies were being massed. We, had, we were terrified. We were all terrified. And even Jews who never came to the Jewish society came to Daven. They came for Mincha, whatever it was. It, it touched every one of us. Once Israel won that war, it was so, so spectacularly. Um, for most people, you know, it just, that was it. That was the end of the crisis, back to life as normal. But I, I wanted to know what connected me to this people whom I didn't know and that were several thousand miles away. What is it about being Jewish that binds you in that sense of shared destiny, as Shimon Bar Yochai put it, um, when one Jew is injured, all Jews feel the pain. So um, I, in 68, um, I decided to come to America because America had the best rabbis who could speak English. Um, and they full stop, they had the best rabbis, full stop. Um, in 1966, Commentary Magazine, it was in the height of all that, inverted commas, death of God theology, had published a volume, a, an issue called The Condition of Jewish Belief, where they'd asked all the, all the great rabbis in America five questions and so I'd seen this and I took a copy of this magazine and went off as Simon and Garfunkel used to sing you know to look for America so wherever I went I looked for rabbis um, and of course I started off in New York but I landed up here in Los Angeles because my late aunt uh, Evelyn Goldstein who uh, used to help run the shop in Beth Jacob's Shul who lived in uh, Beverly Hills, was here. And uh, I happened to be asking somebody, I said, I'm searching for A.J. Heschel. You know, I've been looking everywhere for him. And uh, somebody said, oh, don't you realize he's here? <laughs> yeah, so summer home. Did you know, did you know he, he had a summer home here in, Lo in Los Angeles? So I went to see him in Los Angeles. Uh, and had this shock of... Uh, white hair, exactly like Einstein. We sat for two hours, fascinating conversation. And I had popped into 770 in Eastern Parkway, the home of the Lubavitch Rebbe, as a 20-year-old student, you know, completely anonymous. Nobody, even I didn't know who I was, you know, I was that anonymous. <laughs> and I said, I'd like to see the Lubavitch Rebbe, please. And they all fell about laughing. They said, do you know how many thousands of people are uh, waiting to see the Lubavitch Rebbe, you know, come back a year's time, 10 years' time. So I said, look, I'm traveling around America. I was hitchhiking around America. No, I was going on a Greyhound bus. And, uh, and I said, I don't know where I'll be, when I'll be, but here's my aunt's phone number. And so uh, one Sunday evening, the phone went, and it was somebody from 770 saying, uh, the Rebbe will see you uh, on Thursday night. I had no money at all, so... Uh, the only way I could get to New York was non-stop journey on a Greyhound bus from Los Angeles to uh, New York. I do not necessarily recommend this to everyone. Um, and uh, I saw the rabbi, you know, and he did this extraordinary thing. I'd been going around speaking to all the rabbis. I met Rabbi Norman Lamb. I met um, the, the late Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein. I met lots and lots of people. And I asked them all the kind of questions that philosophy undergraduates ask, you know. And they all answered the questions. The Lubavitcher Rebbe rattled through the questions, like, in, you know, in five minutes. Very, very quick answers. And then he did what nobody else did. He did a role reversal. He started asking me questions. And... Uh, he was asking me, how many Jewish students in Cambridge? I said, about a thousand. He said, how many come to the Jewish Society? I said, about a hundred. He said, what are you doing about it? I said, me? What? <laughs> you know, I wasn't doing anything about it, you know. So he started giving me a hint that maybe I should do something about it. And I began a sentence in reply a really English sentence. It began, in the situation in which I find myself. <laughs> the rabbi very unusually cut me off in the middle of the sentence and said, 
No one finds themselves in a situation. They put themselves in a situation. And if you put yourself in that situation, you can put yourself in another situation. And I suddenly realized that this great man with hundreds and uh, with tens of thousands of followers was essentially telling me to get up and do something. As he said to uh, somebody else, uh, a, a young Jew who came to see him and who told him that he, he was a great fan of baseball. And the rabbi told him, don't be a fan, be a player. And that's what he was telling me. And I summarized this many years later by saying that people got the rabbi completely wrong. They saw him as a great leader with thousands of followers. I said that was true, but the least interesting thing about him, a good leader creates followers. A great leader creates leaders. And so he challenged me to lead, you know. He really challenged me to lead. So I became, came back, became uh, chairman of the Jewish Society in Cambridge, became the first Hillel counselor in Cambridge, and eventually took up studying and so on. Uh, but that's another story for another time. Uh, but in the end, it just showed you, you know, there's not one place in the world that you can go where you don't find a Chabadnik somewhere. And I don't know, I mean, there have been great leaders in every generation, but I don't know of any Jewish leader in history who changed the face of every single Jewish community in the world. Elaine and I uh, got married. We're Bezrat Hashem in five or six months. We celebrate our golden wedding anniversary. And I had never seen mountains before. So I said, let's take our honeymoon in the Swiss Alps. So we took our honeymoon in the Swiss Alps, and um, we arrived in brilliant sunshine. It's magnificent scenery. And the next morning, I open the curtains, and I say, somebody's stolen the mountains. Uh, what had happened was a low cloud, mist had descended, and you couldn't see anything. Well, you couldn't schlap all the way to the Swiss Alps for your honeymoon and not climb the mountains. But we were doing so with a visibility of two to three feet. So Elena and I climbed the Swiss mountains in low cloud, singing Chabad Nigunim. Why? Because we said, if a Jew is lost anywhere in the world, Chabad will find him. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, Rabbi, in your uh, TED talk, you um, offered your perception of what is the preeminent uh, false idol of our time. Every generation has its own false idols. A century ago, a prominent European scholar wrote a book called The, the God That Failed About Communism, and you said that if anthropologists from another galaxy would come to visit at least the secular West today, they would enco encounter a certain kind of idolatry. Would you care to share with all of us, please, what is this contemporary mode of idolatry and how does it affect today's individuals, families, communities, and nations? Somewhere around the 60s, something strange happens. <clears throat> I don't know if you've come across something called a Google engram. Anyone come across this? Google have um, digitized entire literatures. They're working on Ivrit at the moment in conjunction with the National Library and the Hebrew University. So they have digitized copies of everything that was published in England and America since 1900, since before 1900. So you can do word searches and discover exactly when a word is used for the first time, or, or, although you can do that with the Oxford in English Dictionary, but you can map on a graph the incidence of a given word. Now, the incidence of the word we is pretty static across time. But starting in the 1960s, you see a sudden rise in the word I. And that is very significant. 
The second thing that happens is, and somebody's done a major research exercise on this, that, um, that um, the same thing happens to pop lyrics, which are all, until the 1960s, are all about us. Uh, you know, the lover and beloved, it's all Shira Shirin stuff. And suddenly it becomes very I-centered. Today's pop music, not that I'm a great maven on this, is very I-centered. The third thing that happens is you get a whole lot of words appearing that begin with the word self. Uh, Self-actualization, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, self-fulfillment, self-realization. And here, starting here in, in, um, in uh, California, you have um, Nathaniel Brandon, the Talmud Mufhak of Ayn, Ayn, Ayn Rand, is that the name? Um, starting a movement, which starts here in the school system in Los Angeles, called self-esteem. You get other words like autonomy, which is an older word, but suddenly becomes the most important thing that the law must do is give me the right to choose whatever I like. That only exists in, in, in law in, beginning in the 1960s. Or the word authenticity. I'm sure you've read Charles Taylor's book, The Ethics of Authenticity. And all of a sudden, it's I, I, I. And that's bad news. If you look today, outside the Jewish community, in large parts of the West, marriage has almost died a death. Uh, people are, fewer people are marrying, marrying later, more marriages are ending in divorce, and more children are being born outside marriage. In Britain, it reached almost 50%, today 42% of children born outside marriage. And in the States, something quite similar. So all of a sudden, you have problems of loneliness, uh, which has become an epidemic in Britain and America. Number two, you have the social media, which are essentially, Norman Mailer once wrote a book called Advertisements for Myself. And that's very often what social media is. And we know from Gene Twenge of the uh, University of California, San Diego, who published the definitive work on this last year, iGen, that any kid who spends more than two hours a day on social media becomes seriously depressed. And if you look at teenage health uh, and self-satisfaction, self it's constant until 2013. And suddenly, self-satisfaction plummets and rates of depression and, God forbid, suicide attempts and actual suicides uh, rocket. One quarter of 14-year-old girls in Britain have self-harmed. Now, that's huge, but that's all about I. And politics has ceased to be about principles, and it's about I. I'm better than you, etc., etc. So I think this sudden increase on I uh, has been really damaging and is at the source of many, many dysfunctions of Western society. Now, I don't know, have you ever come across a book called A History of the Jews by Paul Johnson? Have you ever come across this? It's a beautiful, beautiful book, one of the most beautiful books ever written about Judaism. And Paul Johnson was, I think he's still alive, a Catholic. And I, we invited him, Elaine and I invited him for dinner one evening. And I said, Paul, you know, you must have spent a lot, many years doing this book researching everything there is to know about Judaism. He knew more than most of us about Jews and Judaism. I said, what was the one thing that really struck you from all this? He said, well, I'll tell you what it was. He said, there have been collectivist cultures in history, like communism, for instance. There have been individualist cultures in history, like the contemporary West, or like second century Rome, or third century BCE Greece. He said, I know of only one civilization that managed to do both at the same time, and that's Judaism. And I suddenly realized that he was, as a Catholic, paraphrasing Hillel's great dictum, im ain anili mili, you know, if I am not for me, who will be? 
Ukshal anilatsmi me'ani, but if I am only for myself, what am I? So it seems to me that Judaism is the antidote to this. And um, I, I, I feel that it's one of the most important messages that we have to deliver right now. There is um, a company called Google. There is a company called um, DeepMind. DeepMind was, the world, was and is the world's leading AI, artificial intelligence company. It was founded in Britain by two Brits, and it was acquired for a lot of dollars by Google some years ago with the proviso that the head office stays in London. One of the two founders of AI, of DeepMind, is a lapsed Muslim called Mustafa Suleiman, whom I interviewed for my BBC series on morality. Mustafa grew up in a from Muslim family and became an atheist at the age of 13. After the interview, two days after the interview, he sent me an email saying, Rabbi Sex, one day could you please take me to shul? I thought for a Muslim atheist to want to come to synagogue was quite something. So he came to shul, not that he wants to be Jewish or religious. And I said, Mustafa, how did you enjoy it? He said, I loved your sense of community. And that's what a community, well, that's what a shul is, that's what a kila is. The we is the antidote to an overemphasis on I. Yeah. Thank you, Rabbi. <laughs> Rabbi, uh, there are people here who started uh, to undertake the endeavor of Dafyomi now that we've restarted. And there's a beautiful agadic portion in the opening tractate of Brachot when um, one of the Talmudic rabbis comes back from the beyond, if you like, and they ask him, what have, they, what have you seen? And very famously tells them parsimoniously in Hebrew three words, Olam hafuch ra'iti. I've seen a world turned upside down. Many might argue that today the relationship between parents and children compared to other previous generations, the approach has been turned upside down. And, and Rabbi, you have defined uh, the art and science and imperative of parenting as leadership by example. Uh, would you care to empower us with some knowledge about how to do Jewish parenting and human parenting um, in a Jewish way with all the challenges that we have in the world today uh, Tech, technological and others. Look, um, I cannot claim to have been a great parent. Uh, my wife, Elena, is a better parent than I am, and I'm going to tell you that my children are better parents than I was. But I think there was one thing that defined my approach to parenthood, because it is what I experienced as a child. You've mentioned, and you know the story, but I'm, I'm going to tell it anyway. Um, my father, Allah Vashalom, really didn't have opportunities. His family was poor. He had to join my late grandfather in the family business, which was selling schmatters, off cuts of cloth in what in New York would be called the Lower East Side, in Britain, the commercial road. It was a thankless task and a profitless task. And I was very conscious. He never complained, but I was very conscious. You know, he was a man who, who should have had an education. He had a good mind, wonderful taste. And he was all, all his life aware that he never had that education. And he would take me to shul. I remember when I was four or five, coming back from shul and asking him, Dad, why did we do that? What's that mean? And I always remember his answer. His answer was, Jonathan, I did not have a Jewish education, so I can't answer your questions. But one day you will have the education I didn't have, and you will teach me 
the answers to those questions. And if anyone asks me, how come Mr. Sachs had a son who became chief rabbi, that is the answer. And I suddenly realized that this is what Chazal meant all along when they compared Noah with Avram. About Noah it says, Et ha'elokim hitalech Noah. Noah walked with God. He walked step by step with God. He waited for God to take the first step. He wouldn't even leave the ark without permission. He wouldn't leave the ark without permission. Hashem had to take the first step and uh, then he took the step. About Avram it says, Hitalech lefanai ve'yetamim. Walk on ahead of me. And I suddenly realized that God was empowering Avram the way my Lahavdil, my father, was empowering me. So I always made space, as my parents made space for us, their four boys, for our kids to go further. Now, it was a lot easier um, for my parents, you know, when you left school at 14 or 16, and you can say to kids, go on ahead. You know, it was since all my brothers and I went to Cambridge University and did quite well, you know, what space had we left our children? But they always knew that we wanted them to go on ahead. And they really have. They really have. So I always feel that that's quite difficult for parents. Parents want to be controlling. And I just think that sometimes that generates rebellion. Sometimes it just generates indifference. That's what dad wants, so I won't want it. I want to be different. And sometimes it just generates conformism, you know, of, of a rather dull kind. So I always tell parents that my feeling as a parent was never to be controlling, but always to say to our kids, you go on ahead. And I have to tell you, there's an extraordinary thing. I don't know whether this resonates with you. When I became chief rabbi, there were 25% of kids going to Jewish day schools. When I left, 70% of kids went to Jewish day schools. <laughs> this generated a community-wide phenomenon, which was extraordinary, of children knowing more than their parents. And their children, and it happens in a very beautiful way. The kids come back on Friday with the Dva Torah, which they say at the table on Friday evening, and the parents learn. And today, very often, it's the kids who bring the parents to shul, not the other way around. So I do feel that we have to say to our kids, in some way or another, we're creating the space for you, and we trust you. You know, I, I um, and non-Jews seem to understand this. We had a situation, uh, I can't remember how long ago, when did I do that Emily Maitlis interview on Brexit? Um, we, ha we have a news program on the BBC called Newsnight, and the news presenter was so uh, confused and troubled by the mess that was Brexit. You know, we were three years debating and de debating and she said, we've got to bring some sanity into this. <laughs> For some crazy reason, she said, Rabbi Zaks, would you come on the program? I know about Brexit. If, forgive me. I, but I went on the program, and it was, it was a great 10-minute interview. And she said, what happens if you're convinced that the electorate got it wrong? And I said, Emily, it's very simple. To be a parent means that sometimes you have to let your child walk on ahead of you, even if you know it's going to make mistakes, and you have to let it learn because that's the only way anyone ever learns. And democracy is built on the same principle. And if that's the way the British public voted, you have to be faithful to that and trust the public to make its decision. And if it made a mistake, let it discover for itself that it made a mistake. But one way or another, you have to trust. And that is really implicit in the Torah. You know, 
I mean, we have a big atheist in Britain called Richard Dawkins. Does that name mean anything to you? I've done three conversations with Richard Dawkins, two on television, one on radio. And, uh, but before I did any of them, I said to the BBC, I'd like to get to know this man. You know, let's see if there's some personal chemistry between us. Because if there is, then we can do it. And if there isn't, we shouldn't. So he came for dinner, and we had a few friends around for dinner. And I don't think he'd ever met <laughs> such highly intelligent people who were so deeply religious. And he was very taken by this. And he was trying to work out how come Jews are one-fifth of one percent of the population, and yet they've won more than 20% of Nobel Prizes. And I said, Richard, it's very simple. For us, the first duty of a Jewish parent is to teach a child to ask questions. The worst thing to do, the worst thing there is, is Misha Eno Yodei Elisho. And you don't allow that to stay there. You've got, to, you've got to teach. We teach our children to ask questions. And I cannot tell you what an impact that made on him. Because he assumes that being religious means, you know, forbidding questions. You should have an unquestioning faith. So the most important thing a parent has to do is to trust their child. And then the second most important thing is marry somebody who's a much better parent than you are, and then it all works. <laughs> Rabbi, um, you've been exceedingly generous with us. And as we move to conclusion, I want to please ask you if you care to share one final vignette with us. It's one of the most exquisite anecdotes I've ever heard you recount. And the reason I'm asking you if you care to share it with all of us here is because I think it's symptomatic of what the world expects from us, the Jewish people, at our finest. Would you be so kind as to share with us uh, your journey in very tragic circumstances to Israel after the Rabin assassination? Um, you traveled with two um, great British leaders. And uh, what surmised in the plane? What did they learn from you? And what did, they, what did that teach you about what the world wants to see in us and cherishes in us and respects in us? Fourth of, fourth, fourth of, yes. fourth of November, 1995. Correct. Motzei Shabbat, we hear of Nachman al the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. Um, the next day I, was, I had a day full of appointments, inducting new rabbis in the provinces. But uh, John Major, who was then the prime minister, invited me to join him on the plane as, the, as part of the official British delegation. He went out with Tony Blair and with Barry Ashdown, the head of the third party. After the funeral, he had to go on to Australia uh, and Prince Charles had been there. So Prince Charles gave a lift to myself and Tony Blair and Paddy Ashdown, so we flew back in the Royal Plane. And the Royal Plane's very nice. <laughs> but it goes exceedingly slowly. Um, it's like a very ancient Rolls Royce with wings kind of thing. So a commercial flight, flight from... London to, to Ben-Gurion Airport is four and a half hours. But if you go on the Queen's flight, it's over eight hours. And it has to stop halfway to, for breath and refueling in Brindisi. So, uh, and I, I was due to be sitting next to her. And there's just this little compartment, two compartments, one with six seats and one with 20 seats for the, for the press and the et cetera, et cetera. So we're sitting two facing two and one facing one. Um, and I was supposed to be sitting next to Tony Blair, but there was a general election in the offing, and he'd never. He, I thought he might have to form a coalition with the third party. So I said, "Have you ever sat and had a conversation with Paddy Ashdown?" He said, "No." So I said, "You sit next to Paddy, and I'll sit and I'll, I'll read a book." So here's Prince Charles here, and nobody opposite him. That would be Les Majeste. You get sent to the Tower of London for that. And there's Tony Blair sitting with Paddy Ashdown. And I'm reading the only book I have, which was uh, Mikraot Gedolot, with, you know, Chomish, with all the commentaries. And he is looking at this. Um, and, he, you know, the, he's never seen a book like this. There is no book in English like a Mikraot Gedolot. Even Shakespeare, Midalam Aforshim, 
Uh, it doesn't look like that, you know, with here's Rashi and here's Rosh Bam and here's Ibn Ezra and here's Ramban. And he was absolutely fascinated. And he said, Jonathan, can you explain this? So I explained to him exactly what is the text, what is the Rashi, who is, who is Rosh Bam and who is, his, who is Ibn Ezra and so on and so forth. And he's, he's enthralled by this. Um, and we don't realize that nobody quite has that approach to textuality that, that we have, this conversation, this commentaries on the commentaries and so on. And then he said, Jonathan, will you teach us some? So I say, okay, well. <laughs> so I give an hour's shear on Parshat Shavua to Tony Blair. Prince, Prince Charles, just across the aisle, is hearing this, and he comes across and listens in. And for an hour, I am teaching Torah to our future king and our future prime minister. And they were the start of two very, very special and deep friendships. And I said to myself, you know, Rabbi Akiva had a verse, you know, he, he used to say, you know, all my days I wondered, when will I have the chance to fulfill this verse? I said to myself, I have had a chance to fulfill the verse from Psalm 119. Be'edotecha neged malachim v'loevosh. I will speak of your statutes before kings and not be ashamed. Rabbi, we want to uh, extend our heart Felt gratitude to you, sir, and to Mrs. Joanna Benarush. And um, Rabbi, we know you're fond of quoting the great William Blake, the English poet. Mm -hmm. So in his words that you've used yourself, thank you for this gift of tonight, of giving us the opportunity through your words and sagacity to hold infinity in the palm of our hands, and eternity in an hour. Rabbi, you have received countless dozens of honorary awards and degrees, and we want to please offer you on behalf of Sephardic Temple, Tiferet Israel, and the greater Los Angeles Jewish community a small and minute token of appreciation that we have authored for you. And Birshut Harav, with your permission, I will share it with everyone else what it says here it has our logo in our centennial 1920 to 2020 and it says the following whereas Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs is the supreme representative of the Jewish voice in the conversation of humankind whereas Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs articulates a unique vision of religious humanism for humanity in our time Whereas Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs honored the Sephardic Temple Tifereth Israel and the greater Los Angeles Jewish community with a centennial lecture on January 21st, 2020, corresponding to the Hebrew date of the 25th of Tevet, 5780, we, all of us present here, would, would kindly like to express our heartfelt gratitude and admiration to you, Rabbi, and wish you success in all your worthy and sacred endeavors. And it concludes with the concluding verse of Psalm 91. May Hashem satiate you with a long and healthy life, and may you continue to behold in His salvation. Amen. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, one, one second. Here we go.